Okay. Hi guys. Welcome back to Manifest with Armine. This is Armine and I'm a law of attraction consultant. Um, very happy to be back guys. Very happy to be sharing another video with you guys. And I have a very special guest today. His name is Mr. Dwight Lee. Um, some of you who are following me probably already know him. If you've been in the clubhouse space in terms of manifesting, um, creating your life intentionally, you've probably been into a couple of his rooms. Um, so hi, Dwight. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Let me give you a little intro about him. So Dwight is one of the most electrifying keynote speakers. Um, he has an Amazon number one best-selling book called The S School of Self-Transformation. Um, he's the creator and host of The Sudden, Sudden Eye Impact. Am I saying that right? The Night Impact Show on BBS Radio. He's the creator and host of the Awakened Manifest Des Destiny Show. Uh -huh. Destiny Show on Roku TV. Dwight Lee has a YouTube channel, um, which is Manifest with SII Power. Dwight is mindset. He's a mindset mastery coach and corporate law of attraction consultant. That's a lot of uh, a lot of. Fun words to explain. Just someone who's great and amazing has a lot of um, a lot of insight to share. A lot of experience that has gotten him to where he is today. And um, I like him for his energy. I like him for his knowledge. I like him for the way he um, hosts his rooms. Um, if you guys have been to Clubhouse, um, to any of his rooms, you'll know that he has you know huge rooms with a lot of um, people who are there to hear him, and he has some interesting guests on all the time sharing their stories so Dwight thank you for being here <laughs> oh man thank you so much for that um amazing introduction and just for having me um I'm a huge fan of yours and uh um you know just licking my chops to start to learn from you and just you know collaborate with you and different stuff like that because you have a strong broad knowledge and wisdom base and a lot of evidence in your life to prove it. So you're not just, you know, giving the people theories. So I have a great deal of respect for you. I'm a fan of yours. And I mean, you're, um, uh, you're really laid back, but you are a very, very powerful teacher of truth. Thanks, Dwight. Dwight's been making me feel good about myself ever since <laughs> we've been friends. So um, I, I, really, I really appreciate that. And it's funny because, you know, for, for a long time, ever since I joined Clubhouse, which was over a year now, um, you know, when I would pop into his rooms, like, I would always feel like, you know, he's this authority figure, and I was, like, a little shy to, like, ever raise my hand and stuff like that in, in those rooms, but, um, but so it's kind of fun that, you know, he's, he's with me on my channel now, and I get to, you know, sh not only talk to him, but share our conversation with you guys, because when we were talking last week, um, we were, like, saying, like, you know, when we can you know, chat again. And I was like, you know what, let's record it this time because <laughs> um, the, the conversations are, I think, really valuable, you know, especially for pe other people who are into manifesting and stuff like that. Because, um, you know, when you hear our conversations, just like talking regularly, I, I, there's a lot of things you can pick up on that, that, you know, help with the manifesting process. Because you realize like, where other people are coming from and we have similar things that we're going through and similar things that we might want similar things that we maybe we've achieved stuff you want to achieve maybe we're talking about something that um is part of the process that you're going through so so yeah i wanted to record this and share it with you guys but it's basically just me and Dwight having, having, having some fun so um so the biggest thing that we've been talking about lately with dwight is neville and and you guys know that I, I share stuff about from different teachers, you know, Joseph Murphy, Abram Hicks, Neville Goddard, Florence Global Shin, the list goes on. But Dwight is particularly interested in Neville stuff now. So you want to share a bit of your excitement? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm definitely, um, definitely interested in Neville. And I'm fairly new to Neville. Um, I had a coach. And I consider him a mentor now that coached me like two and a half years. And, you know, he was telling me over and over again, man, you need to get Neville. You need to find out about Neville. You need to find out about Neville. And so I don't know why I didn't really move or whatnot, 
but he just kept telling me literally like two years for sure. And so I did go and buy the books, but it's like, I will, I don't know if there was resistance of, of looking into them. Mm -hmm. And so there were things that were happening, um, you know, in my life, you know, that really coordinates and correlates with Neville's teachings. So that's why I'm more interested in really getting um, to know him now. And I can give you an example. Like when I went to New York last year um, with my mom and, her, and sister on our birthday, um, basically the way it was set up was everything was paid for. Not that I didn't have money or anything, but they really, really wanted me to go. And I'm like, I'm celebrating my mom. And so I ended up buying her a Louis purse in Manhattan you know, so that was the big deal because ever since 1982, I've always wanted to go to New York City. And I remember the kids used to tease me and laugh at me because, you know, I used to, I was kind of extra, like I was said I would sell out Madison Square Garden. And I said this now, not knowing how or anything, but, you know, I thought it would be through basketball because the only thing I wanted to do was go to the NBA. I wanted to play in the NBA. So that's how I thought I would fill up you know, Madison Square Garden. But the point of it is, is that, you know, in 2021, you know, for my mom's birthday, her 61st birthday, I finally made it to New York City. Now I wrote it down on paper way back in 1982 when I was seven years old. And that's a manifestation, even though it took so long. The point of it is, is and I still have the paper that is written on the notebook and I just remember, I was teased a lot when I was little, you know, and kids would make fun of me like, man, you know, you're from a little bitty Oklahoma. You're never going to make it to the big city, New York City, where Broadway is like, no way. And so it happened. The tickets were paid for, the hotel was paid for. And so literally, if I didn't want to, I didn't have to spend any money. That's manifestation. So that's one thing that I can definitely share. I mean, I knew, I knew you went to New York with your mom last year. I didn't know that you had it fully paid for and that it was something you had written down when you were seven years old. That's, that's Yeah, and the funny thing about that is uh, for the actual trip where everything was covered and even the Uber rides and the Lyft rides and everything, my sister paid for that. Now, I want to tell you this. My sister, when we grew up, she, this is my oldest sister. She's super stingy. Like, you can have everything from her except money. That's why I'm telling you this was a real manifestation. <laughs> even the food. That's why I like, I said, man, I got to do something. So I bought my mom a Louis purse, you know, nice. from the Louis, Louis store that's inside the big Macy's. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's, that's something that I'm sure your mom is just gonna remember forever. That's. Oh yeah. That's she funny couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. That's amazing. And look, because my mom, my mom is also super tight, like frugal, like. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't she doesn't waste then money she needs that. then she needs to be spoiled yeah that's funny. I mean when you tell me that like you were kind of picked on you when you were a kid for saying that you know I'm going to do this I'm going to do that I was also like I was also and, and it's not even like I probably didn't speak as much as you did but if I had like a, a dream and someone picked up on it uh, like had an idea that I might want this in the future like when I was in junior high school I was Sandy in Greece, you know, in the school play. And, um, you know, someone asked me, oh, are you going to be on a uh, broad? Are you going to be on in the real one on Broadway one day? Because Greece was on Broadway at that time. And then, you know, my friend next to me was like, Psh, yeah, right. Like she'd ever, you know, get to that point, get to that level, you know. And I did want to be an actress back then. <laughs> I, I was like insanely obsessed with musicals and theater. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's so big, you know, for kids to, to hear people say, you're never going to do that. Ha ha. Like, that's ridiculous. Like why even have that dream, you know, but where are they now? Yeah. You know, that's the question. Like, where are they now? And, you know, the only reason they said that to you is because they didn't believe in their own dreams or they were afraid to believe in their own dreams. So yeah. that's, that's so important because they say that, like, they say that like, oh, your subconscious mind is basically like absorbing of like everything you've heard when you were growing up, you know, or even now, but especially when you're like more impressionable um but the truth is that you can't really blame the outside influences because you you choose we each individually choose what gets accepted into our subconscious mind 
And like so many times I remember like growing up that I felt like, you know, sad or like um, that I wasn't capable of something or anything was out of my reach. If anyone implied that from the outside, I internalized it that way. Like I didn't say, no, no, no. I, I know I'm going to do this. I know I can do this or I know this is possible. It's just, I, I absorbed what they said because I internalized it as, you know, okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But not everyone does that because you have the option, you know, when you're very, very little, it's different. Like when you're a baby, you just, you know, obviously you're hearing things and you're absorbing it. But, you know, as soon as you have that mind of your own, you know, it doesn't matter what people around you say. It matters what you accept from that statement. You know, and we were just a few minutes ago, we were talking about Neville, right? About when he was little, um, when he was in school and his teacher singled him out and said, here's an example of someone who will never speak for a living. And instead of him just absorbing that, he took that and he decided that, oh, no, no, I'm going to show them that, you know, I can, I can do that. I can be a good speaker. And look at him. Like, he's like one of the few people that I can listen to on end on YouTube because his voice and his form of communication is so, you know, it's, he's just so well-spoken. Um, so thanks for sharing that. That's really, uh, that's really, really important. So what, what do you think, do you think that's what it was? Just that your inner voice was like louder than the outside voices that when you were growing up in Oklahoma city? Well, the thing is, uh, see, I was teased a lot, a lot, you know, um, when I was little. And so it still affects me now. So I started out in boxing and then basketball first. So like, I think that's why I went really, really hard in basketball. And I can be very vulnerable right now, even to the point like, now a lot of like people will tell me that I'm handsome, but like I actually thought I was ugly because of how I got teased. And what? I was like super, super shy. And like, I didn't really go after girls. Like I remember getting a number like in fifth grade when I was 10 years old, right? But then I got the rejection. So then I didn't try again to like actually date a girl until my senior year. So like seven years, so like five-year-old and then you're waiting till you're a senior in high school. And then you have the high school sweetheart and then get heartbroken. And then I wasn't ready to try to date again for a whole seven years. And then three years after that, I got married. So like, mm -hmm. I see the paradigm, like it's seven years, seven years and seven years. So yeah. this stuff affects you on a deep level. And yes. so like when people say like you're handsome or like, you know, I, I do like to dress like in suits and stuff. And, you know, I know that, you know, I'm very professional looking, but people give you a compliment and you can't even take the compliment. So like when people say stuff to you, just like you said, I did internalize it. It hurts you and it affects you all your life until you're able to overcome it or whatnot. And I think that's why I went so hard in basketball, because I felt like, you know, people don't like you or people you're ugly or you're this or you're that. So basketball is where I got my confidence and where I sort of built myself up, but you still have to overcome the part of thinking that you're ugly when, you know, several people have said that you're handsome, but you still don't believe it because of that programming from when you're little. Yeah, but the, I mean, I'm sure you get by now that the people who say that you're ugly, it's because they feel ugly and they're jealous of you. <laughs> so yeah, sort of kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, like, I, yeah, so, so that's, that's amazing. That's why I think like sports and, you know, athletics is so important, you know, because, and I can say for boys, but boys and girls, I'd say for everybody, because, you know, it really gives you that focus, you know, it gives you a place where you can be confident, you know, it gives you a, an outlet, you know, right for your emotions. Like, I know my boyfriend's always like, I mean, he, until like a, a year or two ago, he was always like going playing basketball. He'll just like show up at the local court and be like, you know, play with anybody who will play with him because it's, it's, it's a great way to get out, <laughs> to get out certain frustrations. You know, he was going through different things, you know, all these years that we were together, um, mm -hmm. whether it was financial, um, financial struggles, you know, certain insecurities, or if it was like family problems or um, grief, you know, his brother passed away. Like he had to get all that out of his system and, you know, mm -hmm. basketball was his, was his outlet. So I can imagine like, being the young kid, you know, who finds this talent, you know, you had this, cause you, you didn't just play, like you were really talented. <laughs> you are really talented. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Do you still play ever? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I trained up um, some players that actually, I mean, I won't take credit for it, but actually went on and played a little bit of time in the NBA, actually multiple players, I think around seven or eight of them. But no, I really haven't played, like really played, played since like, really played like since 2001. But, you know, I'll work them out, you know, you might get intense and you may, you know, little one-on-one to three or four points or something like that, but really not since 2002. But, you know, because of the muscle memory, you know, I could very easily walk up to the three-point line and probably hit two or three out of five from each spot. And in the mid-range, I'm pretty sure I would hit probably three or four out of five because of muscle memory and just, I mean, I yeah. put in hundreds of thousands of hours with basketball. Like, that's the only thing I literally wanted to do. Wow. That's awesome. So how did you how did you get into, you know, being a speaker and a teacher? of? Oh, well, like a- that's the thing. So I actually first did a tape way back in 98 and released it in 99 called When the Unthinkable Becomes Reality. Mm-hmm. And I think in total, it may have sold around 5,000 copies because I actually had right. it like in Hastings and Blockbuster, like, and then just selling them just random and then people just ordering them. So um, that was the first project. Now, I've always been a writer. Um, I'm more of, I would probably say I'm probably 20 times better at writing than speaking. And so um, the most recent things that I got uh, speaking engagements came up because um, people, because of social media posts. And then when uh, I got on Clubhouse, so I think a little bit over a year ago, like people were ranting and raving, like they were like, man, like they never heard anything. Like I was from outer space, like, man, you're a powerful speaker. And yeah. so I know right away, I got like three speaking engagements, um, Kansas City, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then Virginia Beach. And like Virginia Beach to me was the, the, the cause for Philadelphia was like more um, really, really important because it encompassed parents and kids. So it was a very, very dynamic venue, something that I've never ever experienced before. And I don't think like there's anything like that, but the one that I, I guess, really kind of really let me know like, hey, you can really probably do this at a high, high level was Virginia Beach because I set it on fire, you know, speaking only two times, you know, for like 30 minutes and then 15 minutes. And like it had, it was virtual and live. And like, it was like, I think 50 different places represented and like the people they just loved as like, man, this dude is like, they were comparing me to some of the great greats, but I stay humble. I say no way, but um, like, it was really genuine. (laughs) Yeah. Like I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, I thought I had did okay, but like from, you know, the emails and just people saying like, man, these people are going crazy over you. Like it was pretty uh, mind boggling. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of like that really gives you direction. Cause like a lot of people say, Oh, I don't know, like what, what, what to do, or, you know, if people are like in a transitional time and they don't want to do what they're doing anymore. And they're like, I don't know what to do though. I don't know what to do next. And it's, it's like, sometimes it's sometimes it's hard to believe it, but just do what you're drawn to do what kind of makes you happy. And even though you don't see the whole picture, just like inch by inch, if you just start making choices of things that make you happy and feel a little fulfilled before you know it guess what you're on you're on a stage or you're on a you know on a call and there's like thousands of people who are like really satisfied and and happy you know because of something you just did and that's yeah there's not a lot of feelings like that right not right, a lot of no. things feel that way, you know? I'll share one thing that's very powerful um for the audience too um have you are you familiar with Peggy McCall no she studied uh, she's been a student of Bob Proctor for over like 42 years or maybe even a little longer I may have heard so, her name so what happened was like I just recorded like on a tape recorder right like I'm gonna speak on these stages and I said like I'm gonna get to interview her and so like this is what I would tell the audience like even if you don't really believe it if you record that and you listen to it it's gonna happen because it happened and then I'll tell you, I got the pleasure of interviewing her on my radio show twice. And to this day, we were at the same event and even Les Brown came in 
And I have another story to tell you on another episode about how bad I wanted to see Les Brown uh, back in like 2004. And I was in the wrong room and it shows my shyness because I didn't have the courage and boldness to get up and walk past all those people to go to the right room. And so I ended up, when something's destined for you, it ends up happening anyway. So fast forward, I'll just tell a little bit about it since I went into it. Bob Proctor and Les Brown actually swapped. Les came and taught us, and wow. Bob went to teach Les's crowd in the same hotel, the Sheraton Hotel, LAX. And wow. so um, we were at the same event, and to this day, I have Peggy McCall's home number. I have her cell phone number. I have her address and everything because mm -hmm. I spoke that onto my tape recorder and onto my phone and I used to listen to it and I thought no way I even wasn't even consistent listening to it I'm being honest and it happened and because of that I got to interview her twice she came on the first show and she said like she believes that she actually met me and we we were at the same event and she wow. was on stage she was close to the stage sitting on the front row and all that and she swears up and down that she met me. You wow. know what I'm saying? And so it's like, if you just put a goal or intention, a hard intention on a recording, and you just listen to it and just forget about it, it yeah. happens. It happens. You know, it's funny because just, I think it was not either yesterday or today, probably today, um, I was, you know, scrolling through one of my feeds, social media feeds, and there was this meme where it was like, you know, Dave Carell, the office guy, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like it's a, it's a it's a picture of him and then on top it says like someone is telling you things don't just happen because you speak it you know and then it's Dave Carell saying I don't speak it I declare it <laughs> and it's, <laughs> that's, really, that's really true like we are literally everything we speak is prophecy you know yeah. what, we, what, we, what we say is what we're agreeing to and and, and it's funny because when you don't realize this yet we think that we're speaking as a response to what's happening, but what's happening is a response to what we're speaking. And mm -hmm. it's just, we, we go into, we make our lives into so much of a cycle that we don't realize which is the chicken, which is the egg and which if one came, even came first, you know? So, um, but it is, it's, we literally declare what's happening. And if you have the, and people ask me this, you know, time and time again, what is more, um, I think we good. Ah, oh, you want to mute? I can't can hear you. Pause you. for can you pause for one second? Sure. Okay. Let me hold on a second. Just a second. Do you want me to pause the recording? All right, one second. All right, we're back. <laughs> okay, so everything's good. Um, what were we talking about? I don't remember where we left off. <laughs> uh, about the uh, the recording and like how uh, the decree and the declare is a little bit different. Oh, yeah. And like, it, yes. it, like you said, it was a prophecy, literally. Yeah, we were, we're literally, we're, we're, oh yeah, I was saying a lot of people ask me that, like, you know, when you have something in your heart that you want to manifest, right, do you, talk to people about it or don't talk to people about it because there's different things even in scripture it says um one says go and tell like jesus says go and tell go and tell no one right and then mm -hmm. there and then there's one that another part that says you know speak speak of what you want so this is what i've gathered through experience and through like different teachings um if you are not confident yet if if you have not bought into it yet and you're still doubtful and easily discouraged, then I wouldn't share it yet. But if you have decided that this is part of who you are from now on, and this is something you're committed to as seeing as part of your self-concept, then absolutely share it because that's when, that's gonna add to your confidence to it. And that's gonna help you see yourself that way more. Um, so, because before, like I know before, like years ago, years and years ago, um, I used to get so easily discouraged that when I would speak of what I wanted to other people around me, I would kind of deflate, you know, I would feel, even if people didn't really, you know, say, oh, you can't do that, or 
if there was just even no response, I would feel very discouraged for some reason. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I felt like, oh, it's stupid. I'm never going to do that. You know, um, that's how bad it was for me. That's how little I believed in myself. Um, but, you know, as time goes by and not just as time goes by and we become um, more confident in our, you know, in our power to create things, but uh, things in our lives, but also in each desire, the, the stronger you start to identify with it, you want to speak it because once you, you pass that tipping point of really deciding that I want this for myself, then you speak it and it becomes more real. And then people, you guess what? That at that point in your life, you're surrounded more by people who, once you speak it, they actually see that as part of you. You know, they're not gonna be like, no, they're gonna, they're gonna be like, oh, cool, yeah, and they can actually see you doing that. And and um, it's it's very important to be able to come to a point where you can speak it, whether it's even just to yourself. You know, if you look in the mirror and say, you know, I am this, and I am now this. That's that's creation right there. Mm -hmm. Powerful, and I, powerful. You're big on the I am. <laughs> yeah. I about that. yeah, so I am is the most powerful thing or phrase there is. I mean, that's your pure consciousness. So whatever you put behind that, that's what you're creating, good, bad, or indifferent. So you want to watch what you say I am too. Like, I mean, when you say I'm, I apostrophe M, that's something to get totally different. But when you say I and then AM, you want to be conscientious and cautious and aware of what you're saying because you literally create it instantaneously. Like, even though there may be a gestation period or incubation period before it shows up, but it could be instantly too. You just want to be real um, careful on what you're saying. And you've heard the saying, you know, loose lips sink ships. And, you know, the power of life and death really is in the tongue. I think a lot of us don't really understand it. But if you just see it this way, when you, words are invisible, when you release that breath, that air, that substance, it goes into the ether. And, you know, it says it in Isaiah 55 that it doesn't return to him void. You made his likeness and image. So it's not going to come back to you void. It's going to bring back the mental equivalent. See, that's a problem too, because a lot of us have said stuff and we didn't cancel it and we don't recognize our harvest, but we sowed it by saying it. Saying it is sowing. So that's why, like, another thing about me too, besides the basketball court, like, I, I was like super quiet. Like, I thought a lot. I thought a lot. And I go back to it because like how my grace, you know, really elevated and changed. Like I didn't really say much. I was always like concentrating. I knew about focus. I didn't know so much about attention, but I had good focus and concentration. Like even with shooting free throws and, you know, three point shooter, that's mainly what I was. I could shoot like, I mean, just inside half court on end, literally not making it up. I'm talking about not just in practice shooting like wishful shots. I'm talking about I did it in the games. And so that's belief. That's faith. That's focus. That's knowing what you want. It's being intentional. It's being deliberate, you know? Yeah, you were saying that, you know, a lot of your practice was literally playing the game in your mind, you know, and taking those mm -hmm. shots in your mind. And, that, and we know because in the secret, you know, it says that, you know, when the athletes like an uh like a runner will can run the the race in their mind and those same muscles are fired you know even when they're not actually running there's mm -hmm. still that connection and and that memory you know keeps on because if you and this is funny because like i mean the few times i've gone to the park and like shoot shot some hoops with my boyfriend which i'm not great at but you know i like to do it <laughs> so, yeah. um, it's like it's basically like if you visualize it going in, there's like 90% better chance that it's going to go in, you know, yeah. even if, yeah. even if you're just in that moment, as you're looking at the hoop, you know, you visualize going, cause that's what literally guides our, 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 our body to do the right thing, to get it there. Cause, mm -hmm. cause I, I firmly believe that like, that's a perfect example of how everything in our life works out. If you visualize the end result, 
then your body will do the right things. Your everything, everyone around you, the conditions, you'll you'll throw at the right time. You know, if there's a gust of wind that's gonna come, you're gonna you're gonna um, respond accordingly without even having to calculate it because you're everything in the universe around you in that moment is orchestrating perfectly just so you can see that you know that that swoosh. Mm-hmm. And uh, because it's it's like um, like they say the universe abhors a vacuum, right? So if you've already seen that in your mind, it's going to do whatever it can to bring you that result. And um, that's so that's so important because I think a lot of people are discouraged from doing certain things in their life that they, you know, dream about because they feel like, oh, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And when you love something, first of all, it's not the same thing as hard work, right? It, it's work and it's sometimes feels like someone from the outside might look at you and be like, oh, you know, they, they work so much or they work so hard. But when you love what you're doing, you can't avoid, you can't not work because you just, you're always drawn to it. Like I'm always thinking about my work, you know, like even if I'm like laying in bed, <laughs> I'm like either doing stats or, or I'm just thinking about, you know, a phone call I had, uh, some better approach I can have to something, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's just really important, I think, for all of us to absorb that, how important it is to imagine something in our mind's eye and to stop thinking and being discouraged about things that we want in our life, thinking it's going to be too much work or it's going to take too much time. Because if you have your subconscious on mind, uh, on, on your side, then there's so little that we actually have to do, you know? It's just, you, yeah. you have to do your part because God helps those who help themselves, right? But right. A, part of that is the first being willing to see it in your mind's eye yeah it's the getting past the the sight to vision because you can only see the point and then six zeros and then the one so 99.9 percent of the stuff you can't see it and it's kind of like you know either going to be the particle or you're going to be the wave in quantum physics you want it to be the wave because it's like when it's matter on matter it's going to take time to bring it into fruition. It may happen. It may not. But Mm -hmm. when you're the wave and you're dealing with the quantum field, all possibilities, all probabilities and all potentialities exist. And that's why I'm thankful that like, you know, because coming from my family, like no one had the grades that I had, you know, I've had every science, I've had every math all the way up to calculus three. So I understand this stuff, quantum theory, quantum mechanics and quantum physics, like, science and spirituality and a lot of religion lines up you know what i mean i'm not talking about dogma but looking at the principles the laws that govern you know because the principle works for all people in all places at all times so it removes all the excuses like if it works for queen armin it'll work for you but you have to have the knowledge and then you have to integrate it implement it and appropriate it the same way she does and then only three things can happen Similar results, the same exact results, or even better results. That's right. what the law says. So that is what it is. Exactly. Are you familiar with the law of inverse transformation? Neville and uh, Joseph, you both. Uh, yeah, I can't. I get stumbled on the words, but basically it's like if a fact can create the reality, then the reality can create the fact. Or if the feeling can create the thing, right. then the thing can be created by the feeling. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And that, what you just said reminded me of that because it's like if, if, if someone else has something that you wish to also experience, you know, it, it's funny because like jealousy or envy is so not necessary because if, if you're seeing someone who has something that you like, that's literally an offer to you. It's like it's saying, hey, you want this? And then our response to that is, is telling our God self how much we identify with that. So if in that moment we feel jealousy, then we're saying, I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that. But if we look at that in appreciation, we're literally becoming the part, the version of ourselves that is already enjoying that thing. It doesn't matter if it's in their hand or if it's, if that person is not in their arm or ours, it doesn't matter. Cause if you can appreciate what you're looking at, then you, it's already yours. It's it's you're appreciating it. So on some level, it's also yours. And um, the law of inverse transformation says if if a if a physical fact would would cause a psychological state, then the psychological state will in turn cause that same physical fact. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's like a, that's an, um, it sounds amazing, but it's not magic. It's not magic. Like I'll share another story with you too. Um, and this happened and, you know, I didn't know about Neville because I really just started hearing about Neville in like 2019. And I think I bought the books 2020. Maybe I bought it at the end of 2019. I'm not sure because my coach was working with me from um, on that level from April of 2019. And so I tell a story about my uh, high school teammates. We were really good friends. His brother actually played in the NBA. And this is a true story. They had like three different dream homes and everything. And I spent the night in two of them. And so he had a Range Rover. And like, I always wanted a Range Rover. And this story is kind of spooky. And so one time we were going uh, from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And he was like, drive. But like, I'm thinking like, I mean, I know this car costs over you know, $100,000, I'm thinking like, what if I wreck it? What if I do something? What if I break something? Like, I can't pay for it. This is what I'm thinking, like scarcity, right? He's like, man, drive it, man. See what it's like to drive it. He's telling me, I don't even have the confidence. I don't even have the courage to drive it. He literally made me drive it. And so fast forward, 16 years later, 16 years later, 16 years later, exactly. I get the same exact vehicle a black Range Rover with the same rims and everything. This was 2002 oh. when I drove it. And then oh. I got my own August of 2018. And oh. so it's like same exact car, just a newer model. You know what I'm saying? But same exact everything, black leather seats, sternal wheel looked the same. The, uh, the system with the GPS, everything was the same. It just was more modernized because we yeah. come from yeah. 2002. To 2018 and like I just wanted one like strong burning desire you know and it's like you know if you have the regular money like you're probably not going to just go buy it you know what I mean right, so there right. was bridges of incidences and synchronicities and serendipities yeah. and this really happened I'm I remember like when I first got it I just would just look at it like I didn't believe it I was just staring at it like yeah. Oh my God, like you got it. And I'm like, is this really yours? And it's like, you're shaking the keys and everything. You're hitting the alarm and it's like, you don't believe it. And that's the same feeling I had last week with you when I was like, I'm five years old and the candy costs <laughs> one penny. You know, we're back in 1980 and all the candy is whatever you want, it's one penny. Like yeah. you got a hundred pieces of candy for one dollar. Plus yeah. I think it's like a dollar three or a dollar four with the tax. So like this stuff is real, but you don't know that you're operating in it. And I told the story of how I did these amazing things in basketball, but I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I, you know, I thought that it's just love and I'm just watching Jordan on TV, but there was more to it than that. And so now over the last 10 years or so, 12 years, I'm tapping into what, what I was actually doing, you know, through the experiments and helping people get results. And it's like, man, it's just, it's like one laboratory where you're getting these hypotheses and you're making observations and you're finding out what works and you're just trying it because really in life, the most successful people are the ones that are doing the most experiments. Yeah. Don't think that these people, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and all these guys um, are not getting uh, contrary feedback because it's only through the contrary feedback that you can get better and figure out what works. Like the guy uh, Edison that did the light bulb he kept mm -hmm. taking steps and kept taking steps and then the light bulb came on. Right. When, when was it that you, cause you said you've been doing this like for a long time, right? Before you even realized it. Like for example, mm -hmm. like playing basketball when you were young, like when you started playing basketball and all this stuff. But when was it when you realized, when was it that you started learning about the mind, you know, the mind influence in your life and, and that you've been doing this all your life. Like, when was it that you started learning this stuff and started realizing that, oh, no, wait, I already know this. Like, I've been doing this. Well, one thing I can tell you is from second grade, Miss Slater, creative writing. So every Friday you have the creative writing. And I did not like art. 
or music. I felt like I couldn't do those, but I've always admired those. Mm -hmm. But every Friday, literally for the whole year, I won the prize in creative writing. So my mind is really imaginative. It's really creative. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. I've always been able to express myself in writing, but I was a super, super shy kid, except for on the basketball court. Like literally, you wouldn't hear anything from me except on the basketball court. But mm -hmm. writing was something that I knew I could do like at a like superlative level. So I think that breeded the confidence and winning, you know, every Friday, because I remember being at the uh, parent teaching conference and Miss Slater said to my mom, like, it's really unfair to the kid, like the way that he writes and he depicts stuff. It's like so detailed. It's like it's from a movie. And like, I don't understand how he's only seven years old and that he can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I knew like there was a gift there. Um, and I just always, even like I started reading it, I think four years old, no one like showed me to read. I was able to read the encyclopedias. My mom, my grandma had this encyclopedias. Then I had this one uncle, he, used, he couldn't read. And so he used to make me read the Bible to him. And it's like, I didn't know I could read the Bible, but I guess by association, I'm like, well, if I read this book, I can read this book. And so that's sort of like how it started uh, too. So I always was a study person. Like I just devoured the books. And so back then they had this thing, we have Dairy Queens and they're still around now. And they would give you like, you know, you could get a blizzard, you could get an ice cream cone, or you could get a full meal deal if you read so many books and your parent and your teacher had to sign off on it. So like in um, elementary school, I devoured books. I think the last time I counted, I've read over 2000 books and I've read Think and Grow Rich about 325 times. So like, I love to read, I love to learn. So I'm really like, that's what I am. I'm a sponge. You know, I just study, study, study warm, kind of like a nerd. And so I think between the writing and just the study habits, the work habits, cause I work studying wise the same way I work in basketball. And I think that's where you get a lot of the stuff that I've been able to be somewhat successful at. You know, when you mentioned at first about like when, your creative writing classes on Friday, like when you would do creative writing on Fridays and that you were really good at that. I mean, that tells me a lot because in order to be good at creative writing, you have to have a strong imagination. Like not only do you have to have a strong imagination, but it actually um, strengthens your imagination as you write more, because it's like, basically think about it. You have, a, you have a talent. First of all, everyone has an imagination that can be strengthened and tuned, but when you already have, you know, a strong imagination and then you're putting into practice, you know, even that once a week, you know, as a kid, that's a big deal. So you were sharpening it, you know, and you were, um, you were tuning your ability to imagine in a way where if you can tell descriptive stories, because I, I wasn't that young, I was in high school when I was first told that, oh, you know, I write really well. And, um, and just like you said, too, I write better than I speak <laughs> and you speak really well. So <laughs> that's, that's a, that's amazing. I don't speak really well yet. I'm not as comfortable in front of a crowd. Um, somewhat, you speak but not very well. You speak very well. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I don't know how many of my videos you've seen. There's a lot of ums and whatever, <laughs> ums and ahs in there, but, um, no, I mean, it, that's so important. Just the fact that you can you know, see that connection between the writing and your imagination, because writing is a great way to, to sharpen your, imagine, your imaginative skills, because we're always imagining anyway. So when you're writing, it's like you're letting yourself choose what you're going to imagine now, you know, and, and sometimes it feels like we're not choosing because it just comes to us. But even when you just like stay open and something comes to you, it you're growing it from that point. So you're literally just exercising your imagination. And I remember when I was when I was in elementary school um, in Queens, New York, I remember like walking down the hallways and hearing all, all the teachers talk about how important imagination is. And they really put an emphasis on being creative. And so I thought that was great. And I don't know if it, at that time there was a special movement that started for kids to be, you know, really focused on using their imagination. But I knew imagination was important. My I come from a family of artists and musicians. So I I got that. But what I learned with Neville and with all the, you know, manifesting stuff I've learned is that, oh, 
<laughs> imagination is not just important for the sense of creativity like art, but it's literally creating your life. Like what you imagine is creating your life. Like my dad has this friend, actually we introduced him to her. So I, I guess she's a family friend and um, she lives locally here and she's into the arts. Like she, she, she paints and does like certain sculptures. And my dad's like, my dad's an artist too. Well, he's a musician by profession, but um, from my uncle, he got into the arts. So um, he had his art studio and you know, she was working from her, from her home. So when I visited her home once, I saw that all of her artwork was, um, it was, first of all, there was a lot of pictures of her alone um, and then there was a lot of paintings of women, like single women, you know, just single women, single women. And her thing, go figure, was that she wanted to be in a relationship, and she was, <laughs> and she was struggling, you know, getting into a relationship. Oh, and, so and the funny thing is that I was already coaching and I already knew this stuff, but I walked in and I was like, wow, I was really impressed by her work. She's just amazing work. But I, I just mentioned, like, really quick before I left, I was like, I was like, I was like, try, I was like. I was like, why not try creating something of like, you know, a happy couple, you know, like a happy family, and and then um, not art, not all, not all artists are willing to <laughs> take suggestions from other people. She's uh -huh. like, she's like, she's like, I can't. She's like, I create what comes to me. I can't just, you know, make something that didn't come to me like that, you know. And but little did she know. And and meanwhile, she had invited me to her house because she knew what I do for work and she wanted to talk about it. But she didn't see the connection there. She wasn't ready yet. Um, so she, she asked me in for dating advice with lo like law of attraction stuff, but when it came to actually like realizing what she's putting her focus on creating, which was a, a lonely woman, she kept drawing a lonely woman and, um, painting a lonely woman and it was all over her walls. And when I suggested that she maybe paint a happy couple, she, she was resistant. She was resistant again. That was years ago. I don't know if it's changed. I haven't really seen her much, but, um, what like we're always imagining we're always doing stuff and that is the gift of writing of painting of speaking because when you get to the point that you're writing something down or you're speaking something or painting you have the ability to use that as feedback as to what's been going on in your head all the time mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't realize it's been happening until we want to say it until we want to write yeah. it down. That's why sometimes when my clients write to me like emails and they're like complaining about something or they're make, belittling, belittling, belittling themselves or they're trying or they're seeming just not like they're God speaking. You know what I mean? Like they're they, they seem like they're not powerful when they're writing. Um, like I'll write back. And I'll be like, did you like really think about this before you wrote it to me? <laughs> like, don't you know I'm going to mm -hmm. you need like we need to filter what we write. Not not because we want to write lies, but we don't want to, you know, you know, prophecy, like all these things, right? All these prophecies of things that we don't want. And we think that we're writing it to express ourselves so that we can get out of our system. But why not instead use that as a practical thing and transmute it, you know? There's, yeah. a, diff there's a difference between um, avoiding something that you feel and transmuting the energy into something else. Because once you do that, you're not suppressing it anymore. It doesn't stay in your body. It, it literally that energy gets transformed into something more useful. So like, I, I'm just like used to like replying to clients like, "Are you sure you want to write that to me?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna totally pick on everything you just wrote to me and correct it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Okay, I think I did not realize how much time passed by, but yeah, it's been probably almost an hour we've been recording so um oh wow yeah we should probably wrap up. i know you have another appointment so um how can people reach you because i mean for a lot of people watching this on my channel they're just meeting you for the first time so if they want to get in touch with you or learn more about the stuff you teach or i don't know give them all everything clubhouse information i could write it down under the description too but just... uh yeah i want one thing i want to get them is to go ahead and subscribe to my channel uh um manifest with SII power on YouTube because there's over 200 and something videos over there. And then um, I could uh, send you my uh, email where they can reach out to me also. And I was going to ask, cause I'm not really that technology entwined, but if we can put up the video on both channels, that'll be interesting because oh, yeah. you know, I'm a big time fan of your work. And I wanted to share one other thing 
um, also that's the same year that I first ever heard about Barbados, 1982. They read the book to us, Witch of Blackbird Pond. And it's, it's based out of something, a story in Barbados. It just right. came to my head, so I thought I would tell you about that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I always thought of Bar- Barbados as like a vacation destination. I- I've never been there, but it's just awesome that he he grew up on this like amazing paradise island, you know. And then he he wanted to get away from it because, you know, his his dad his family used to say, you know, New York City is the center of the world, so that's where he went. Yeah. But yeah. Have you ever been to Barbados after that? Uh, I haven't. I have never been. But I just remembered that book all of a sudden. I was like, well, I'm supposed to tell her about this. Because yeah. she read it out loud. And I remember it was like so hot and it was boring. And we're listening <laughs> to this story. And then we had to do a summary on it. I was like, that's the first time I ever heard of Barbados, 1982. Wow. Amazing. Seven years old. Yeah. Well, I know. In in the Neville Goddard Club and on Clubhouse, I know we're all planning on doing some kind of <laughs> trip to Barbados one day. We'll see when that happens. But yeah, yeah, I know you told me that the family literally owns a lot of it, right? They they the that company that the dad and the brother started, the brother Victor, the dad uh-huh. Joseph, I believe his name was. Um, it's been expanding ever since. So um they're huge and and like everyone knows the goddard name over there it's called um goddard enterprises llc i think or or goddard enterprises something if you look at if you guys google it you'll see Um, yeah yeah not just barbados but surrounding islands um they're in like um airline catering um a lot of the um wine companies that you guys are familiar with the names of are from them they do um rums different kinds of rum they owned a rum factory. I think they sold the rum factory, but they still own the company um, that um, that they sold the factory, but they still own the companies that make the wine at that factory. So we're not the wine, the rum. So yeah, they, they have like a whole bunch of stuff in different industries. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This has been amazing. And I've been totally honored. Uh, I mean, hopefully maybe next, early next week, we can do another one because it's like so much stuff that we can get into that I believe will really help uh, the people. And one particular thing I want to talk about is like how I was thinking that I would get only like maybe $2,500 or $3,000 on the credit card. And I'll save this, I'll tease them. The amount that I got was like unbelievable. <laughs> so they'll come back and tune in. <laughs> Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, so we'll do this again. And um, I'll put all your information on the description below the video. And if you want, you can, I'll send you this um, recording so you can upload it in yours as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your time. And I'll let you go to your next appointment and see you next time. Have a great day. Okay, thank you so much. My honor. Thank you. Bye, Bye -bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching.